What is up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Mindset Podcast. Today, we are joined by David Suarez, who we've been uh, really wanting to have on the podcast and we finally made it happen. He is a CEO and lead facilitator at Interactive Training Solutions, among many other things uh, that David does. He's embedded in our community. He invests in, in Miami and in a lot of Miami businesses and really throughout the country. Uh, but David, welcome to the podcast. We're so happy to have you on. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Excited. Yeah, so are we. And we're going to start uh, with our warm-up questions that we usually like to start with. They're usually a little bit fun just to get to know you a little bit and break the ice. And I think the first one is uh, fun, but also could be uh, really helpful to some people out there who may have uh, some speeches on the horizon to give one day. Uh, and that question is, do you have a routine that you follow right before going on stage? There's people that do all kinds of crazy stuff. I've heard push-ups. People do push-ups right before going on or or maybe some breathing tactics to get their minds relaxed. Is there something that you lean on? Because I know you give quite a few speeches and, and you're a pro at it. So what, what does your routine look like? Yeah. So my routine has a little bit of everything in it. Uh, part of that comes from my days as a producer in both film and television in my previous career. So using some of those tips and, and pieces, I constantly work on not only myself, but also my clients that I coach in public speaking, specifically about how to prepare for uh, a presentation or a speech when you're nervous. Now, I take another part of my life, which is improv comedy, and incorporate that as well. So I bring those two worlds together. What does that look like? Well, the first thing that we do is if we're in a, a state of being, uh, whether that's in some cases, it's just so nervous that you're a little manic. Uh, one of the things that we do is we do some deep breathing pieces that are really designed to relax you, bring you back down, lower your heart rate. And that's done through some deep breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth. And then we actually get inverted by, if you can, touching your toes. Uh, what that does is it adjusts your spine. It changes the blood flow. What's wonderful about doing that piece is that I've seen professionals who are basically in a near panic attack all of a sudden get it together. They go out on stage. They're great. On the flip side, I've worked with people that just don't have a natural high energy state and they need it for their public speaking. So one of the things that we do is we bring in an improv exercise and it's called countdown. Countdown is simply where you take a hand and you go eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You do that with your left and then you do it with your feet and you keep removing a number. And every time you remove a number, it gets faster and more frenetic and you end up in a frenzy by the end. What's great about that is you're literally like ready to walk or not walk, run through a wall uh, at a full sprint. By the end of that thing, you're almost out of breath, but it does lead with the charge. Uh, the other thing that I do um, just because I normally don't need to do either one of those two pieces, but sometimes I do. Sometimes I, I really need to get refocused. Um, a, a key tip that I would give to anybody that is going to be engaging in public speaking of any sort, walk your room. You need to walk your room, get there early, walk the entire room, the stage. If there's a stage, fantastic, but walk the entire room. People want to see a show. They don't want to just hear content vomited out of somebody's mouth. So a key to that is if you walk the room, you're essentially writing code of this is where I can go during my presentation. This is where I can't go during my presentation, which is probably even more important. So those are my three big tips. Uh, for a pre uh, a pre presentation or pre public speaking uh, piece, obviously knowing your content, rehearsing your content is is key. But I think everyone knows that one, so I figured I'd give you something different. I appreciate that, David. And I think um, you know Anthony and I have both given a number of uh, presentations, speeches, what have you, uh, in our short lifetime. And I think, uh, at least for me, I can definitely say that there are nerves running, uh, definitely as an introvert myself. And I, I want to ask you, because I feel like this is something that we always get, a question that we always get from people. And even going to, you know, going back to leadership and different things like that, people think that certain people might be born with a gift or a talent to, to speak. And I'd like to say that there are some people that might be more extroverted, might have that high energy just kind of already inherently in them. Um, but I'd like to argue that this is a, definitely a skill that can be learned, right? I want to flip the question on you. What what can people do or what do you have to say about that question or what advice do you have to people that want to learn the skill of public speaking? Yeah. Uh, and 
nobody ever believes this when I tell them this. I started out as an introvert. I went to film school to get behind a camera and never get in front of it. And uh, through a series of, of unfortunate but yet fortunate events, I ended up challenging myself to get into improv comedy to overcome that fear. And I found my voice. I think we all have a voice. And I think the key thing is if you are one of these people that says, all right, I can't do this one challenge yourself to do the things that you can't do in improv. We say, follow your fear. So follow your fear. The other thing that I will give you, and this has really been my guiding force. If you want my North star is I know that every time I get on stage, every time that I speak to any group, no matter how big or small, my job is to help people. If I am helping people, if I'm serving, it's not difficult. If I'm there for me, everything changes and it's not easy anymore. Uh, recently, I did this kind of like TED talk for HR called Disrupt HR. I did it out in Naples and I hadn't had butterflies like that in years, in years, uh, maybe a decade plus. I mean, that long. I was really nervous. And the thing that calmed me down was not a breathing exercise. It was just reminding myself, your content, your delivery, and everything in your being that you're about to deliver is about helping people. And all of a sudden, I was cool again. <laughs> But before that, I was freaking out because I, I was focused more on me instead of the audience and how I was going to serve them. So I, I give that to people. Isn't it so fascinating, David, how, you know, very fitting, right? This is the mindset podcast, how the mindset can just change everything and snap of your fingers, right? Just thinking of something differently in a different way that you haven't thought before can can make all the difference. So, you know, I, I love that that you shared that with our audience because that's absolutely right. And that's what we, we, we preach here on the podcast that you, everything starts with your mindset. The six inches between your left and your right ear are the most <laughs> powerful real estate, valuable real estate anyone will ever own. Um, but I, I do want to ask you, David, and also part of our warm-up questions here is, what is your superpower? Uh, I seem like I feel like you might have a couple, but if you can narrow it down to us, what is something that you pinpoint as uh, that you do really, really well at? Uh, yeah, it's not an easy question. Uh, talking about yourself is not always the easiest thing. Uh, but if I would say that I have a superpower, it's I just have a passion to help people. I love watching people grow. I love watching people have that aha moment where they get things, the light bulb goes off and you've made their lives better, whether that's how to present better, how to be a better leader, or if we're talking about interpersonal, how to get teams to work better together. I do a lot of leadership coaching and in doing that work, I get to watch people evolve and then they affect people. And a lot of times they don't just affect the people that they work with. They end up affecting the people that they go home to. And those people get a better person, a better human being. So I look at it as if I'm helping people, that's my superpower. And I think that's all of us, by the way. I think at the end of the day, if we're all in the service of making other people better, we make ourselves better by virtue of the fact that we have to teach that skill or we have to affect that change in a person in a positive way. But on the flip side of it, what ends up happening is what we teach is what we learn. And that's it's a really cool thing. David, where does this mindset of yours come from? Uh, did it come from an early, early age? Did you have an aha moment maybe in college or later on in life where you realized this is your superpower? Where, where does this come from? Because it's definitely very unique. And, and uh, I, I hope that everybody takes a little piece of, of that and also realizes that. And we're going to get to it a little bit later of, of what is servant leadership. And I know you're a big proponent on that. Uh, right. And it, well, that'll be fun to talk it up with you. But where, where, talk us to where you got to this point. Um, it would probably be too... I'd say two critical seminal moments that really taught me some things. And the first one was when I was in film school, I really was in a very competitive environment and I got sucked into that competition. I like competition. I, some of us do. And for me coming from a sports background, my thing is cycling, you know, it's an individual sport. So even though it's a team sport, you're always competing against somebody individually. Um, and, uh, coming from that, being in film school in that competitive environment, I thought that I could direct one of my student films and pretty much do everything myself. And while I was good at a lot of things, I wasn't great at any one thing. And that film suffered. I learned that I needed to collaborate. That 
was about helping people be their best to make something great as, as a whole. So that was a big learning, learning, uh, uh, point in my life, learning point, um, teachable moment. Now the second one is a big one. And that was, and this goes also back to my film and television career. And this was when I was producing the last thing that I ever produced, which was reality TV. And I realized that I was miserable. I did not like what I was doing anymore and things needed to change. And a good friend of mine reached out with a lifeline, said, Hey, there's this company out in Virginia. I was living in Los Angeles producing TV. And, and he said, why don't you come in and do our corporate video? And while there, that's when the world changed because I was with all of these MBAs. This was the year 2000. So it was when MBAs were really hot. Um, what that looked like was I have no idea what these people are talking about. They're all marketing people with MBAs. I'm a film person. I know how to speak film. And that got me to thinking I need to speak their language. So I went and got an MBA. I got my MBA at FIU in doing so the helping people part just really clicked. It was just something that I just knew that this was my calling. I really enjoyed helping people. When I was in reality TV, I was pretty much exploiting people. And I felt like I needed to take a shower <laughs> to get that ick off of me after every shoot versus when I was working in the corporate world, I really felt like I was helping people say the things that they really wanted to say, whether that was to further their, their business goals, or sometimes it was just to find themselves. And you realize, wait a minute, something cool is going on here. And I would say after that, really where it cemented was a lot of the volunteer work in addition to the coaching and the training pieces that we do here at Interactive Training Solutions, that volunteer work, we've done a lot of work for a, a group called Nifty, an organization called Nifty, which is the network for teaching entrepreneurship. We've worked with high school kids to teach them how to present and sell their businesses, uh, not just in this vacuum or bubble of high school, but also in real life. So we're teaching them entrepreneurship skills and how to, you know, take that to the next level, shark tank it, if you will, if you want to go back to reality. The other part of that has been Leadership Miami. Uh, Leadership Miami, I'm a grad of Leadership Miami. And one of the ways I love giving back is either doing youth leadership Miami for the kids or the actual Leadership Miami. And we've talked a lot about networking, how to get your voice out there in the real world to be able to further your business or just get yourself that job that you need. So helping people get their point across is really what it's all about. It's what I love doing. You know, David, as I was hearing you speak, um, you know, I, I couldn't hear but but think about and, you know, especially something that I think you have in common with so many of other our guests is the fact that you take these risks, right? Going to film school, you know, you thought you were cementing your, your career in Los Angeles. Um, I, I want to take you back to that decision when you were deciding to go to Virginia to do that corporate video and you that pivotal moment when you mentioned you decided to maybe change, have a career change. Not sure exactly how old you were, but I can't imagine it was it was easy. It wasn't safe. It was definitely a big risk. Um, what was that like? You know, I want to know what that pr like decision process was of you really not throwing away, but maybe turning you know your uh, to another direction in your career after going to film mm -hmm. school, after building that career in the film and production industry. What was it like stepping into a whole new arena that you really didn't have any experience in? Um, what was that like? Take us through that process. Yeah. Uh, interesting. I, a couple, a couple of things happened. It was when I was 27. Uh, so I was 27. I was a producer out in LA. I was one of the younger ones and I knew that. And you kind of feel like a hot shot for a while. You feel like, all right, you're the golden boy. You can do whatever you want. And that gets to your head. LA does that to you. If, if you have any kind of success out there in, in that business. And that was great. Uh, but a number of things had happened that really showed me that I needed to make a choice for my soul. I knew that I have a 22 year old daughter and she was born. Uh, she's about to be 23 later on this month. So she was born in 2000. And that really also was a big turning point for me because I realized I would be raising a child in that environment. And also I would be keeping the hours that I had, which were crazy hours. And I would be surrounded by 
this kind of, uh, I'd be modeling behavior based off of what I did for a living. And that was a big problem for me. So that, that forced me to really kind of grow a conscience and, and figure some things out. The other thing was uh, being young and taking that risk was not just about modeling behavior, but it was really, you know, years go by like that. I am 50 and 27 feels like a million years ago. And it also feels like yesterday. I've done a lot with my career since then, but every day I wake up, I still feel 27. I don't feel like I'm 50. And uh, I'd say the, the hard part about that is um, just knowing that when you, you go down this road, you're going to have things that come up and you're going to be forced with decisions and you can go to all the, you know, decision trees and everything that you want out there. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to make some gut decisions that you have to live with. And for me, the big one was I have a career in LA that if I didn't leave, probably would be pretty successful. I definitely was at the time making a lot more money than I would have made for the next five years of my life. Um, so I took a financial hit, but in doing so, I found my calling. I started my own business. I got an MBA. I show my kids, you know, cause I have two now. So I show my kids, this is what you can do with your life. You know, a lot of times us parents love to say, follow your passion, but then we don't do it ourselves. We pay bills to facilitate you following your passion. So I chose to take the path of let me model that behavior. The other thing was I mentioned earlier, follow your fear. There's something exciting about going after the thing that is dangerous. It's dangerous in your mind, but it's really not that dangerous. As human beings, we have two things that we struggle with more than anything else. The first one is change. Uh, change usually happens to us because we try to stay away from change. But those who can embrace change, that's fantastic. That's gold. And I took a moment where I wanted to push it away. And instead, I was like, let me do this. The other one is letting go. It took me a while to let go of my career. And when I finally did, and I had some temptation to go back, I will not lie to you. And I had offers to go back, but I fought it. And then I realized years later, it was the best move. I would have just been doing the same thing over and over again. And now here I am years later and I've built a life that I love. I built a business that I love and I get to work with people that I get to help. It doesn't get better than that. So would it be safe to say, David, that uh, if you had the opportunity to go back and do anything differently that you wouldn't? Yeah. You know, there's always something you could do and it's fun to, to think about that. I also think if I didn't do the things I did, I wouldn't be where I am right now. And, you know, you can always think about where you could be, but why focus on that? You can't change the past. You're in the present. Enjoy that. But you've got to focus on your future. So that's, that's a big thing. Um, if I think about anything from the past, usually they're either friendships and work relationships I wish could have kept going on because I really loved, I loved my crews that I worked with. I adored them. We were tight. I miss that. I miss that sister and brotherhood that we had. Um, I also miss some other parts of, of my career. Um, you know, there, there are things that I, I really look back on some great projects, things that were wonderful. I always tell myself that the best part of my career I can have again. Uh, so for example, the artist in me, I can always go back and create art, you know, for fun, for me, I don't have to do it for a living now. And that's what this passion gets to facilitate. If I want to do it, I got back into cycling because of what I do. I, I I'd given it up. I couldn't do it while I was in production. So getting into cycling again has given me, tons in terms of, you know, fitness and health, but also just a great mental escape from the world and get to go to different places, cool places. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think you have one of the coolest jobs in the world. I was reading a little <laughs> bit about it on LinkedIn uh, and Gabe and I were like, wow, <laughs> like, well, how, how can we, how can we do something like this? Cause um, you're just interacting with people all day. And, and if you love that and, and that's what fires you up, I think it's a phenomenal job to have, especially with that mindset. And not only mindset, but what you're actually doing, David, is is helping these businesses, these people, these leaders become a better version 
of themselves and what a, what a job to have to do that it's it's fantastic and you know a lot of people have jobs that are very broad yeah we help people and that's fantastic but i feel like david i would like to argue that that in your case you see that tangible change somewhat quickly and you can say you could point out and say i help that person do this right help this business get from here to here which i think is i'm sure can be very rewarding for you uh tell us a little bit about what it is that you do what does a regular day look like for david suarez Wow. Uh, a regular day never looks the same. I, and I love that. I love that it doesn't. Um, that's, I think one of the things that us coaches, trainers, facilitators love is that ideally nothing's ever the same. It always has a little bit of a change to it, or in some cases, a lot of bit of a change to it. So for example, I've worked with teams that have to go and present in front of government agencies. Those are huge projects, fun challenges. I've had to go into car dealerships and work with salespeople and help them sell cars and and sell product, which is equally amazing. You get to help people put food on the table. So, and then the leadership piece is always great. Everything's always different. The challenges are always different. What's fun is there's different parts of our projects that we work on. The first part is what you know, I was going back to my film days, I'd call pre-production, right? So this is where you get a request for a proposal. A client comes to you or they find you or they're recommended to you ideally is always the best. And when that happens, you then do a deep dive into what their needs are, what their goals are, what the challenges are, and what some of the constraints and parameters that are affecting this environment Uh, what those are as well. And then you have all the other fun little housekeeping things that you need to know. In doing that, I get to be a nerd and go in my nerd cave and figure out, all right, how can I best help you? That alone is just such a fun process. Learning about an organization, learning about its people, figuring out, okay, this is what's going on. Let's build a plan and let's Go ahead and then execute it. The execution of it is equally as fun because this is where you get to go and put all the flesh on that skeleton where you've got these people and they're humans. You're going to find out things about people. Everybody's different. You've got some alphas. You've got some some wallflowers that will never say anything but have great ideas. You have people that are burnt out that need to find it again and everything in between. So... That's the lovely part about what we get to do. And every challenge is different. Um, nothing is ever, you know, off the shelf, you know, to do some boilerplate stuff. It never is. Even when it seems like it's going to be, it never is. The people always make it different, but the situations themselves are usually pretty dynamic and their challenges are usually something that, you know, always pushes you. And even if it was boilerplate, the fact that we work across so many industries you know, so for example, we're in banking, but we're also in healthcare. You know, like I mentioned, we've been in automotive, but we've also been in pharmaceutical. So you're constantly gathering this wealth of knowledge and experience that you can then impart onto the next. So we become more experienced, we become richer, we become better at what we do with age. We're like a good wine a really good wine that's just going to get better with age. It's like it's been sitting there in 55 degree darkness waiting to be opened and you know decanted and breathe and and then you get all those years of aging and it just is absolutely delicious. So I love that. I like wine. I love that. I love that <laughs> analogy. I love that analogy and I I think yeah. I think uh David it's safe to say that you you come across a lot of different people, like you mentioned, you're in all different types of industries on a daily basis, really. And I'm curious to know from your experience working with this wide range of individuals, is there a common denominator, maybe a common mistake that you see across the board, no matter what industry, no matter what uh, thing they're doing, no matter what type of presentation, whether it's selling a car, whether it's talking um, to a group of individuals, what uh, what are some of the common mistakes or common denominators that you see um, from uh, from up top, from where you are? Yeah. You know, there's, there's different things in different places. I would say if we're talking about presentation skills, public speaking, that is, it's a show. If, if I'm presenting something to you, you've got to make it digestible. It can't just be about delivering content. If AI isn't about to teach us a lot, 
it's that we're not necessary anymore unless we can bring the human element into things. So we need the human element in your presentation or your public speaking situation. Give us you, give us your personality. Uh, something that I learned a while back was I used to be Mr. Perfect. You knew nothing about me personally. You knew nothing about me that would ever, you know, uh, crack this armor, but that's no fun. People don't want that. They want a human being. They want somebody who's flawed. They love comeback stories. They love people who are just like them that fall down and hopefully get back up. So that's a big one. Be a human present in a way that is going to be a show. We love show. Um, so give us the show of your presentation. I'd rather you have one slide and tell me the story than have 20 slides that just say every single word in your story. You know, give me that show. That's presentation side. On the leadership side, um, this one is huge and we see this one a lot. A lot of times we get brought in by either HR managers, VPs of HR, CHROs, uh, which are chief human resources officers. And they're like, all right, we need you to work with our people. And we start working with their people. And the first thing that we ask, well, let's talk about your top people. It all starts at the top. If your top isn't right, your bottom never will be. And everything in between won't be either. So you really have to make sure that you've got a very, one, healthy and high operating, high performing uh, C-suite or leadership group, whatever that looks like. But more importantly, uh, if that is there, how are we making sure that that culture is throughout the organization? You can't work down here and hope that it goes up there. These people can't affect that change uh, the same way that these people can affect that change. So you've got to be able to start at the top, really look at the top. Uh, we see that that's commonly a problem. Uh, outside of that, I would say Another one that's really interesting is that when we talk about specifically sales, a lot of times people are still in that sales mindset of, I've got to go ahead and get to my close. And we often talk about sales in this regard. It's relationship-based sales. So what does that mean? Relationship-based sales means it's kind of like dating. Somebody went out on a first date with you and said, hey, let's get married. You're going to start running for the hills. And that's what we do with sales quite a bit. We try to go for the proposal right out of the gate, or we try to get there pretty quick. So relationship-based sales says, all right, let me get away from the close and let me work towards it. And let me do it by essentially what is a law of attraction. And that is, if I'm here to help you get what you need, that will close my sale for me. I don't have to go after it. I just have to help you. And this goes back to the superpower thing. So I'd say those three things are probably the biggest ones. Yeah, I, I hear you, David. And we, I think we see it too um, very often, even in uh, at a smaller scale, and maybe people are part of nonprofits or their local student government for their schools or any kind of organization people are in. Sometimes there is that disconnect between the very top and then the, the members of that body or, or their employees. Mm. What why is there a disconnect? What is it that uh, that you find that a lot of uh, C-suite individuals, the administrators, why do they, they pro I'm, I'm sure this happens, they even correct me if I'm wrong, but they probably tell you, we're good, we're doing what we got to do. I don't know, it, it's them. It's always them. It's the employees. They're just not buying into it. They're not with it. They have that attitude, but then you go to the employees and it's the other way around and you got to start from the top to the bottom, like you said. I, essentially, I'm just trying to figure out why are are usually the the very top a little bit blinded as to what's going on? Is it ego? Is it a lack of humility? What's happening there? Yeah, a great question. Usually, the disconnect tends to be again we've taken the human element out of things. So, what does that look like? The human element usually looks like this: if there's no interaction between the team and the the uh, the C suite. So for example, a lot of times we get brought in to do team building and that's usually correcting a lot of that type of human interaction work. So we need people to be human beings again, recognize and value each other as humans and really love each other as humans. So that's a big part of it. And that's something that we need to do uh, when we go in to do team building. That is easily the, probably the, the, one of the best fixes, but it's the least common fix because team building is always considered to be a luxury item. 
Uh, it's the last thing that comes back after a bad economy and it's the first thing to go. But it's actually one, it's probably the most cost effective way to attack a lot of those issues. And two, it's the most fun way by far. Uh, so when people are having fun, they're having a great time. The other thing that I think is really big on that, and and again, um, when we're talking about that disconnect, the big thing is we're not listening. Great organizations are listening organizations. That means that they listen to everything externally, which the C-suite people are always great at that. They're looking at the market. They're looking at the economy. They're looking at the the, the industry, they're looking at competition. They're looking at all those things. That's what they're supposed to do and that's what they're really good at. But here's where they usually fail. How do we listen in? How do we listen to our people? How do we mine for ideas? How do we engage our people in a way that makes our organization better? How do we use our people to find out the pulse and the health of our own organization and do this regularly? If we do that, we do that to our own benefit, not our demise when we don't. So that's huge. You need leaders that are what we call creating these listening organizations that truly do listen to everything, both internally and externally. I think, I think David, that's, uh, that's really interesting. You mentioned that and something that I've been waiting to get to, which I feel like you're, you're going to talk a lot on is servant leadership, right? And this is something that sure. um, Anthony and I, really tried to, to dig deep into this this subject because leadership, it might be a sexy word. It might be, you know, this concept that people, oh, I want to be a leader. I'm qualified to do this. Um, but sometimes they don't know that the best leaders are the ones who go first. They're the ones who set the example. They're the ones who are really there, uh, you know, not to be the the, the star of the show, or, but they're, the, they're there to serve their employees, to serve their constituents, they're there to serve the body of the organization. Um, and that's really where you have to roll up your sleeves and be that servant, right? I want to I wanna mm -hmm. ask you, what's your take on that? And just you know, give you the floor right now to, to give us your take on servant leadership, how people can be a servant leader. Um, so we can really flip the script on what traditional leadership might look like um, in today's workplace. Yeah, a servant leader is exactly what it sounds like. Your job, if you need a different word to define servant leadership, I can give it to you in one word. And that's facilitator. Your job is to engage your people. So we talked about a listening organization. As a leader, you need to engage your people. You need to value them as human beings. You then need to inspire them by giving them the runway and the ability to be their best selves in the workplace and that they are fulfilled. This doesn't mean entitlement. This does not mean because I know that comes up quite a bit when we introduce this concept. Well, are we creating entitled team members? No, we're not. What we're doing is we're creating inspired team members, people that feel that they have the license and the ability to affect change within their team in the organization. And your job is to give them that environment that allows them to flourish, to be their best selves. The other thing that's huge is that as a facilitator, your job is not just to provide the resources to do that. That's the easy part, but it's the skill building. It's the definition of roles, knowing who does what, what that is and why it's important. The other part, and we talk about this a lot is, you know, we use a lot of questions when we're talking about servant leadership is the, why do we do things is huge for us. We need to know the why your people need to know the why your people need to be actively part of the why and defining that as well. Otherwise there's very little buy-in. That's why people jump ship and go from here to there and here to there, which is very common in this, in, in our day and age. It wasn't that way 20 years ago, but it is that way now. So if you're going to retain people, you need to empower people. You need to inspire people. So the why is so important. Why are we doing this? Why are you important to this process? Why is your input so critical to our success? Uh, the other part is the how. How are we going to do things? A lot of times leaders love to take all of these great questions and they ask them to themselves because they're so wonderful and their narcissism kicks in and they become this all important you know, leader until the next leader above them 
kicks their butt and then, you know, does the same thing to them and they figure, all right, I've got to do that. The real high performing servant leaders don't ask questions in a vacuum. They ask questions in a forum and they do it, including their people, but they do it with a caveat. As your servant leader, the one who's here to give you everything and make you successful as much as I can, there will be some limitations. We may not be able to do everything that we discuss. We may not be able to make things happen the way that you want, but by taking all this information in, I can give you the best environment to be as successful as possible. There are going to be times where we can't do certain pieces or we have to say no. And that's part of servant leadership. So a servant leader is really about facilitating the environment, facilitating the team, and also advocating for the team. Because that's another part too. We don't work in a silo and we shouldn't, and we don't work in a vacuum. And I hope we don't. We have to work with others. So that collaboration requires advocacy, listening, and also engagement. We've got to engage other people. How do we use each other as resources? Again, I love being competitive, but being competitive internally is a kiss of death. And I know that there's been different uh, modes of thought on that. You know, I know that there's the famous uh, GE Jack Welsh uh, piece where, you know, you'd have six top leaders and every year only five of them stick around and that lowest performing goes and you bring in another one. I mean, that breeds a different environment and the environment that we're talking about is really about how do we elevate people. Part of my job on this podcast is to write down timestamps of when our guests uh, have like a mic drop moment or a really good moment that we then want to cut up and put on social media. And I'm running out of paper here. So if you can uh, maybe slow it down. I'm, <laughs> I'm totally joking. This is fantastic. My my notebook has never been this full. This is uh, incredible, incredible wisdom you're sharing with us. I do want to ask you, David, are, are you hopeful for the future? And, and the reason why I ask that is... I know, like Gabe mentioned to it a little bit a while ago, is that leadership back then was a lot about command and control. Yep. It was, I'm the boss, so you do as I say because we have to do this this way and I'm just do it. That, that was kind of the leadership style, you know, the industrial age and whatnot. And that was just, it was very mechanic. Everything was very supervised, uh, you know, managers breathing down, down the, the back of your neck. And unfortunately, you know, maybe it would make sense. Maybe some would argue during those times. But since then, a lot has changed. And a lot of things now are not so mechanical, or at least they shouldn't be. Um, but yet we still see a little bit of that kind of leadership of command and control, command and control. Do it because I say I because I am the boss and I said you have to do it. Uh, and we still see some uh, some of that today. Are you more hopeful, David, with your uh, experience of speaking with leaders and being really on the ground and 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 assessing companies and uh, finding out what their flaws are and, and individuals as well. Are you hopeful that we're just shifting from this command and control environment to this trust and inspire uh, kind of leadership? Do you, do you see that happening uh, in the near future or, or, or do you see it happening already? It's definitely happening already. Yeah, absolutely. And I am hopeful for it. I'm hopeful for the fact, listen, I came from, I'm a Gen Xer. I came from that command and control environment was used to it. And I know that my generation loves to say, well, look how difficult things were for us. We grew up at this time. We, you know, didn't have all of these wonderful things. And then we did have wonderful things. Like we could just literally leave our homes at eight in the morning and come back when our parents yelled, you know, it's time for dinner and you'd have to come back in. Those days are long gone for most people. So yeah, great. That's wonderful. We all came from someplace. We all had a different experience. That's great for the diversity of bringing in different viewpoints and all that good stuff. What I'm hopeful for, one, selfishly, because I have two daughters that are going to be in the workforce in some degree doing something wonderful. I want them to have that environment. I feel like the work that we do allows us to hopefully pay it forward. But the thing that I'm really hopeful for and what I'm already seeing is that you have this post pandemic paradigm shift that I'll give it to you in this example. I was working with a client. We never, by the way, put client names with their projects together. Just the people that we work with like things discreet. So those two things will never happen, but I was working with a client and specifically we were working on cross-generational leadership and this was pre pandemic. 
And one of the big issues was going remote and trusting these new hires, most of whom were in the millennial and Gen Z category. How do we trust them to have these flexible hours working remotely? We don't think we can do it. We need them in nine to five. Pandemic hits, everything changed. And now everybody's working remotely. Everybody has flexible hours. We've traded time for results. And I think that paradigm shift easily has taught the entire world a huge lesson that trainers and coaches like me, you know, we're, we're moving the needle very slowly. This just redlined it like that. I'm probably doing it opposite, <laughs> whatever way you get it. That's one. The other one that is really big and that has me hopeful is the fact that what we're seeing is we're seeing this shift where what people dictate as a work-life balance, and I don't even think work-life balance is going to stick around as a term for too much longer. I think it's just quality of life. And I, I say it because a work-life balance says, okay, well, this one thing is good. This one thing is bad. Work bad, you know, life good. Uh, who cares about that? Your quality of life better be you loving what you do. And employers and leaders better be facilitating that or we're going to have problems. And when we have those problems, fine, people like me get more work and we get to come in and help you fix that. But the reality of it is your organization will suffer. People, and it doesn't matter what generation now because everybody's in on it. Everybody's figured out that quality of life matters. And if you want to talk about early retirement or the great resignation, that showed people that. So what do we have now? Don't give me work-life balance. Give me quality of life. I want to be passionate. I want to be engaged. I want to be inspired when I come to work because I will spend more time with the people that I work with than the people I go home to. So I better love this. Second part of that is if I've got to say that work bad, life good, no, I'm done. I want out. And that's what we've seen a lot of. So I think organizations have already started getting onto this train about we better make this place great because if not, you're going somewhere else. So I'm very hopeful in that regard. David, I'm glad you mentioned that that work-life balance analogy and example because I, to be honest, you know, this was something that... A lot of my my friends graduating from college were in a way worried about even pre pandemic, right? And it's to be honest, it's something that I've I've started to hear less about. I've started to hear less about work life balance because I think your your example of quality of quality of life is what people are prioritizing, and we can't help but but think and can't help but notice that our life includes our work, right? A lot of people think right. that it's two separate things, but we sometimes identify with the work that we do. We're passionate with about the work that we do. So it should be included in our life, right? It's, it's, it's a one bundle mm -hmm. thing. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, but I want to go here for a second. You gave us permission in the beginning of the episode to, to go deep. So I want, I want to ask you in all of this, in all of your experiences as a life coach, assessing all these different companies, working with these different individuals, what would you say has been maybe the hardest or toughest part of your your job maybe it could have been a particular project maybe it could have been something that had to do with the pandemic but what was what was the breaking point for you where you're like maybe i don't know if i can do this any longer was there was there ever a moment like that in your life it's interesting the answer to that question is honestly no there's never really been a i don't know if i can do this because the guiding principle the north star has always been about helping people and if you truly want to help people it's really something you don't get tired of doing. What has been challenging though, we started interactive training solutions in 2007 in July. And uh, what happened next was pretty much us being at the abyss of a financial collapse. And that was really hard to start a business in that environment and maintain a business. And it was very tempting to give it all up for something more secure financially. Thankful that that didn't happen. Pandemic, same deal. I think what's been cool about both is it's either adapt or die. You've got to evolve. You've got to figure things out. You've got to figure out, all right, what's going to work in this environment? And then you learn new things. 
which is great. That's change that's brought on to use. Two types of change. Change that we seek out, change that happens to us. The change that happens to us is the stuff that you know moves the needle, again, moving in whatever direction, but moves the needle and moves it hard. That's that's a revolutionary change, if you will. And I don't mean revolution like you know political revolution or anything like that. I mean revolution by definition is something that happens quickly versus evolution is something that happens slowly. And that's the change that we usually elicit on ourselves. Now, when we do that, that's great. But ideally, you get so comfortable with change that you move that needle quicker. When it comes to those moments, those two pieces, financial collapse or near financial collapse, housing crisis in 2008, 2009, 2010, and then the pandemic of 2020, 2021, uh, both of those pieces have push change. And so it's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good. It makes you question everything. There are times where maybe you would take that job or maybe you would do, but I'm glad that we never did. Uh, The only other thing I would say from a job that's been difficult is on a personal level. Um, As coaches, specifically as coaches, trainers, not as much because training is about skill building and that's a little bit different. You usually work in group environments, but when we're talking about coaching, you get invested with the people that you coach. I, I always tell the people that I coach this, I'm going to be your biggest cheerleader. I am going to be the person that is always there for you like a loved one. And we, if we do our jobs right, we do. Now, obviously, there is, you know, our professionalism in the in between all of that that keeps it professional. I don't mean it in like a personal way, but professionally, I'm going to be your biggest cheerleader. There are times where, you know, we've had subjects, people that we work with that have had some really challenging, serious, heartbreaking, tragic issues that we onboard ourselves, and, you know. That's usually where the bike comes in for me. A good bike ride will will reset me and get me straight or you know, give me perspective on things. But a lot of that does come home and and you know, it's almost like being a therapist. And if you were a therapist, you're gonna hear things, you're going to experience things that are not easy. And how do you compartmentalize that? So those are the hard moments, you know, where somebody's really got an issue. Maybe it's something personal or maybe it's something you know, that involves some self-destructive behavior, things that you're trying to help them correct or things that are happening in their own personal lives. You know, I've coached people through things like divorces, not that that was why we were brought in. It's just, it's happened as part of the deal, unfortunately. And you're, you're riding along in the passenger seat for somebody's lowest point personally while you're helping them professionally. So things like that happen. Oh, that, that that's incredible. And I think that's what makes you so unique and so successful in what you do is because you're not just providing a service, you're you're with them, you're you understand them, at least you try to. And I not a lot of coaches, I, I would like to bet do that. They just see it more as like, this is a service, this is a transaction. But you go beyond that, you you really try to be there with your clients. And, and like you said, make them family. And I, uh, I, I really applaud you for that. I, I think that's a wonderful mindset to have. And I, I, I like to think that that's, the, that's what makes you uh, so successful. And, and back to uh, some of the turbulence you might have had in 2007 or the, the difficulties that you see day in, day out to what you said earlier, David, your why is so strong that no matter what comes w- with the business or, or with life, you're, you're reminded of why you started in the first place. And that that's what keeps you grounded. That's what keeps you invested in helping yeah. people. Uh, which is uh, really marvelous. I, I really, it, it's very impressive. And uh, before we, we we wrap up here, I, I do have to ask you, and, and I've seen you give sure. talks about this before, and I'm just um, fascinated by this and your take. Oftentimes in leadership and business and politics, really any area of life, doing what is right is not necessarily overlapping what with what is popular. They're, they often conflict. And, and I think you mentioned that in one of your talks. Um, how do you get leaders to focus more on doing what is right rather than what is popular. And I can tell you, if I just may very quickly, and in the political world that that I'm, you know, navigating through a little bit here and I have a lot of interest in politics, uh, 
that's hard, right? Maybe a little bit harder than a business or, or whatnot, because in the in the political world, if you have a candidate that should be saying something because it'll get him or her elected, let's just say something as as uh, as extreme as getting actually elected and having the position they want versus maybe not saying that because it's not the right thing to say or to do. What do you what do you do? How, how do you coach people through these very tough decisions? Yeah, politics is fun, isn't it? So yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get too far down anything political. Uh, one of the things that, you know, we definitely stay away from is politics. The other one definitely being religion. Uh, so we don't go into either of those. Um, you know, we've worked with political organizations and, and things like that. Sure. But we don't get political with anybody or religious with anybody for that matter. But I will say this in going in that saying that we love so much, which is doing what's right and doing what's popular rarely intersect. And when they do, it's great. It's kismet. It's beautiful. Love it. Bathe in that. Take, do some backstrokes and have some fun in that because that's a rare moment when popular and right get together. Popular is usually a short term decision and it's short term thinking. So popular means it feels good right now and it's the easy road. And if you think of the Robert Frost poem, the one about there's two paths in the woods um, and I took the path less traveled and it's been all made all the difference. And I know I'm butchering yeah. that uh, quote. <laughs> close so, enough. Close, close enough. enough yeah, you yeah. can look it up. Great. Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not a quote I know by heart. I just thought of it in the moment. But, um, but uh, where I'm going with this is Short-term thinking, doing what's popular is going to serve you right now. It's playing checkers versus playing chess. Doing what's right is the harder thing to do. And maybe you're going to take a lump for it. And maybe it's a terminal lump if you're talking political. Because that can't happen, by the way, and it does. But I think this goes back to who you are as a person. If you are a person that believes in the things that you say and do, that your deed is your word and your word is your deed, then it should not be difficult. And as a leader, I'm going to get us out of political as quickly as possible here, but as a leader, when we see that what you say is what you do and you are willing to do the thing that is more difficult, we're willing to understand why that is. And we're ready to have a much more open mind. Uh, there were times... And, and I can give you some examples back from my production days. Uh, I, I was put on this reality TV show and um, put on, it doesn't sound very good, but I was producing this reality TV show. I was the new producer. I was working as one of three established producing teams going out into the field to produce uh, 138 episodes each throughout the course of a season, roughly about 10 months of a year and or eight months of a year. And so, uh, third, third day on my crew was just grumbling. They were so upset. Our, our shoots were taking so long. They were so inefficient. We weren't really getting good stuff and I had to figure things out and I could have done the popular thing, which was listen to my crew and just do what, exactly what they said. Hey, just do this. But in doing the right thing, which was I took the next week to really study what works, what doesn't work, where can we find efficiencies? I didn't know it at the time. I was doing a lot of business stuff in film, but taking all of that and um, uh, what am I trying to say? Taking those pieces and really looking at the systems of how we shot and how we produced allowed me to figure out, okay, we can shorten this time down in between of setting, setting up, breaking down, setting up again when we had to change locations. And now we were operating faster. We went from the crew that got back hours after every other crew because it was kind of like, if, imagine if you will, uh, I'll put it in a Star Wars context. Imagine, you know, everybody's going out to take on the Imperial troops and all the rebel, you know, fighters are, are gearing up and they're all leaving at the same time. That was our production crews. Uh, my production crew would come back four to five hours after everybody else. So my crew was always upset about the fact that everybody else got home before they did. By the end of that season, every crew came back three to four hours after us and our production pieces were 
far superior in terms of content. We had figured it out and it took a while. I chose to take the tack of let me do what's right versus what's popular. If I just did what's popular, we would have emulated the two other teams and we would have just kept doing the same thing. And instead it was like, let me go out on a limb here. Let me try this. And by the way, it's my speaking of quotes. That is my favorite quote. You can't reach the fruit unless you go out on a limb. You're going to have to take some chances and doing what's right is taking a chance. So do it. It's interesting. Uh, it's hey. interesting, David, because I'm, you know, as I'm actually a producer, I hadn't mentioned it yet, but I'm a producer in the film and, and video <laughs> production space as well. So it's kind of interesting awesome. uh, hearing from you. And especially with this example, I've been in situations on both sides of the spectrum, right? Where it might be easy just to, hey, you know, our DP is hearing this. Hey, we got to wrap this thing up. Let's go. Let's got, you know, let's get this thing done. And then the flip side of that is like, but is that maybe the best thing for longevity? Is this the best thing? Maybe it'll fix our today, but it's not going to fix the rest of the project. It's not going to fix the rest of the production. Um, and, you know, just to broaden that that subject a little bit more for anybody really in any industry, you know, to, to Anthony's point, I feel like it's really difficult nowadays. And, you know, a big example that I really noticed where this uh, leadership practice was really uh, exemplified was during the pandemic, right? We saw a lot of a lot of Fortune 500 companies, a lot of big corporations setting many good examples, uh, you know, when it came to PPE loans and different uh, things when it came to, to loans of giving them back because, you know, they're doing all right. They don't need them. And that might have not been the popular thing to do. They could have, you know, added that to their top line. Um, but it's not what they did. They actually did what was right. Um, so I do believe, you know, going back to what you said, there is hope um, for our workplace. There is hope for the corporations, for the individuals, for the entrepreneurs, um, that are out there. And I, I think if there's anything that, you know, people take away from this episode is really to, to do that, to do what's right versus what's popular. Because I think that's really, especially, um, as young people are graduating and getting into the workflow and into the workspace, um, they, they need to have some sort of North star. They need to have a guiding light. And if they have their morals and their ethical compass, you know, set on the right thing, I feel like they would make the, the right decision over the, the popular decision. But, um, I know we could be talking for for another hour and a half, but thank you so much, David. This was such a, a pleasure. You dropped so many awesome. little uh, wisdom nuggets for us, and I know um, this is going to impact our audience so so much. So really do appreciate it. Um, but before we go, I do want to give you a chance to maybe let our listeners know where they can find you, maybe where they can get involved, sure. where they can reach out to. Maybe if you have any speeches you want, they want you to to hear. Um, where can they find you? Cool. Uh, thank you for that, by the way. And, and thank you for having me on um, the podcast. I think it's fantastic what you're doing. And more importantly, uh, it's just really, I love having this kind of talk and this dialogue, whether it's public or not yeah. is, is immaterial. I just really enjoy that we're talking and, and more importantly, that you have this vested interest in getting this type of information and, and experience and wisdom out to people and people at a time in their careers that is so important that they can do something with it uh, and do a lot more with it actually mm -hmm. uh, than they would years later. Yeah. So fantastic. As for, for me and us, uh, well, first place to find me is uh, one at Interactive Training Solutions. Uh, that's our company. Interactive Training Solutions does team building, training, coaching. It's all on communication skills. So everything from leadership, uh, networking, public speaking, sales, presentation skills, interpersonal skills. We work a lot with teams. Uh, we do a lot of keynotes as well. So in that uh, sense, you can find me on LinkedIn at David Suarez MBA. Uh, same goes for uh, Instagram, uh, but LinkedIn is probably the most preferable way for most people. Uh, beyond all of that, you can find Interactive Training Solutions again at interactivetrainingsolutions.com. Also on uh, LinkedIn as well, go ahead and and like our stuff, you'll find out where I'm going to be speaking. Uh, I've got a number of speaking engagements coming up. So you, if you want to do something that's a little bit more in public, if you're you know around, that's great. Uh, I also will say this. If you connect with me on LinkedIn and you have a question, I will answer it. I love doing that and I'll do it for free. So, you know, it's career advice stuff. I've answered a lot of questions on that. Uh, people have asked, hey, will you review you know, this presentation I'm about to deliver, I'll happily do it. I mean, I can't do deep dives on things, obviously, but if I can help you out, I'm going to help you out. I really do mean what I say. So hit me up on LinkedIn, connect with me, ask away. I'm there for you. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, so much, David. I really appreciate it. And you heard it here first, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're proud to have you on and exactly we're very excited for what's to come for you and the near future, David. So appreciate it again, having you on. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Gabe.